Awesome. Well, sounds good. Thank you so much. Um, so everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. So in this particular session is Pawning Networks, an introduction to network pen testing. So I don't know about you, but I'm excited about seeing this one. Uh, this particular session is going to cover a lot of great hands-on tools. And uh, as we were talking about, you've got an excellent instructor here. Um, so please, if you will, use the chat. Um, if you've got some questions, I'm going to be helping moderate. Um, so if you can't see some of your questions, he'll, he'll ping me and he'll say, hey, do we have anything? And I can uh, ask him some of your questions. Um, also use Discord. Discord we're heavily using this year uh, to make sure that uh, we get an opportunity to chat and have good conversations. So without further ado, Philip Wiley is uh, going to be uh, educating you on poning networks through pen testing. So take it away, my friend. Hey, thanks for the warm introduction and welcome everyone to this session. Hope everyone is enjoying the conference. So far, uh, Joseph has been known to put on some really good conferences. And we're fortunate to have all these virtual conferences with the social isolation. Uh, the previous conference that Joseph did back in May, I guess, or so, was pretty cool. And and got the also got the Red Team Village coming up in, in August, I guess, around DEF CON time. But at any rate, thank you for, for joining. Uh, not only do I work as a pen tester, I've been working as a dedicated pen tester for a little over eight years now. I had my OSCP for a little over seven years, but I'm the red team lead at, at a uh, large global consumer products manufacturing company. And I'm also the adjunct professor at Richland College. I teach ethical hacking and web app pen testing there. I like to teach workshops and uh, plan to do more in the future. So just keep your eyes out hopefully come up with some new topics and tomorrow if you haven't registered i'm doing a web app pen testing uh workshop tomorrow and these are, are you know entry level introduction courses to teach you some of the basics and and how to get into you know get started in pen testing and i'll share some educational resources but i'm also the the founder of the pwn school project which is an educational meetup which started out was mainly offensive security topics but it's kind of it's kind of changed over the years. I mean, I, well, it's like we've only been around almost two years, but it's it's changed as time's gone on because there were a lot of people trying to get into security in general. So we don't restrict it to just uh, hacking type of talks. We we expanded it past that. But uh, it's we have our recordings online on, on our YouTube page, and so and we stream two meetings a month. So that information's out there. So I've been in in IT and information security for a little over 22 years. I'm also the co-host of the Uncommon Journey podcast with Alyssa Miller and Chloe Mistoggi, and I was one of the people interviewed for the Tribe of Hackers Red Team book. So uh, what really got me into presenting at conferences and doing workshops was my passion to to share and, and teach. When I got into, you know, after, you know, I've been in pen testing a while, some people wanted to ask me questions on how to study for the OSCP, so I started sharing information. So that got me interested in teaching. So I'm able to do that on a broader scale now. And so we're going to cover some some methodology, go over some methodology uh, information here. And so if you haven't checked out, pentest-standard.org is for the p-test standard, the penetration testing execution standard. And this is a really great uh, standard to go by for your pen testing. This takes you from beginning to end of the pen test, and it's written by a lot of great people that you've probably heard of in the industry. Dave Kennedy is one of the writers from Trusted Sec, as well as Carlos Perez from Trusted Sec. Uh, Joe McRae that does a lot of uh, training at conferences and online, and numerous others. So this was built by experts in the industry. It wasn't just someone that put together a list that didn't that wasn't experts. It was people that actually have been doing this in the field, hands on, and some of the best around. And also uh, some other good op, uh, methodologies and information to look at is the OWASP Top 10 and the OWASP Testing Guide. So these, if you need to learn a little more about web app pen testing, these are good resources there and a good place to learn the OWASP Top 10. If you want to get into pen testing. One of the things you'll you'll go through in, in a job interview is notoriously the vulnerabilities they get at, that you get asked about, whether it's specializing in web app pen testing or just a normal general's pen test job where your main focus is going to be networks. They're still going to ask you about 
SQL injection and cross-site scripting, the different types and how to remediate. So just knowing those are really good for, for interviews, just knowing that information. And so the PTES methodology, you have your pre-engagement interactions, intelligence gathering, threat modeling, vulnerability analysis, exploitation, post-exploitation, and reporting. But as you're getting started out as a pen tester, a lot of the pre-engagement interactions are going to be ran by practice leads or engagement managers. They're going to work with clients to collect information to scope a pen test. And so as a pen tester, you'll be more likely in, involved on like the, the kickoff calls in some of the meetings for the pen test. But typically when you're getting started out, someone else is running those, collecting that information. So when you're getting started, you know, we're gonna, you're gonna be more focused on intelligence gathering down through reporting. And in this, we're gonna focus more on intelligence gathering, uh, not so much on threat modeling, but vulnerability analysis and exploitation and discuss post-exploitation and reporting. Uh, threat modeling, some of this is just, as you learn to pen test, a lot of this just comes naturally. You kind of, from uh, hacking, systems and doing pen tests, you kind of know the areas to look for. So like in your uh, more advanced targets, like if you're wanting to test like a, an ATM machine, then that gets a little more tricky because then you're looking at not only you're looking at the ways you can hack the system, you're also looking at the environments this, this system's hosted in. So if you're, if you're looking at an ATM machine that resides somewhere out in the country that's no one is is monitoring it 24 hours a day, there's not a lot of traffic, then physical attacks are gonna be more, more likely. Whereas if it's you know in a heavy, heavily populated place, more your logical type of attacks, less trying to break into it physically are going to occur. So you're taking that target and you're also uh, taking in consideration the environment. And so this you go through and you'll look at what you're testing, you'll look at the different threat surfaces that you can possibly attack and try to kind of map out your pen test because where you're doing application or network it's really not as big of a requirement it's kind of loosely a little more loosely done in your vulnerability analysis you're going through any information you've collected during your intelligence gathering uh, and seeing if there's anything that's vulnerable as well as doing any kind of scanning to collect more information exploitation is where you're actually hacking into the system so this is where the the fun part starts, so you go in through and, and uh, hack the system, and post-exploitation is what you can do past exploiting that one system. Can hey, Philip. Yes. Hey, sorry to interrupt you, buddy. Um, the oh, slides okay. are not advancing. So uh, if, if you're on the first slide, that's all we're seeing. Uh, we're actually just seeing your, um, uh, your slide sorter view. Can you see it now? No, it hasn't, it hasn't updated yet. Okay, let me go back and reshare this. There we go. Okay. So yeah, let me just go ahead. And All right, sorry back. about that, folks. So this, so that way you can get see the URLs. And after you know, message me on Discord. I'm pretty frequent on that Discord, so you can send me a direct direct message or or message me in the chats in general. But here are the 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 uh, resources that I was mentioning there the pen test standard you know wasp top 10 and these are really really good resources and they're referred in a lot of different training and books and here's the PTES methodology as i said we're going to be focusing more on from the intelligence gathering down to the post exploitation and kind of a simplified methodology this is just very basic your intelligence gathering your reconnaissance against that target, vulnerability analysis and exploitation, and within that post-exploitation post as well. So your intelligence gathering, you're just, you're gathering information against your target. And this could be going to, if it's externally facing, then you've got companies like Netcraft that have online sites that you can look up information on targets, mainly web, web application based or web, you know, websites they'll you can find out what system it's being hosted on what all uh frameworks are running on it is this you know IIS running ASPX or is this a, a, a Apache Tomcat server running Java server pages so you're able to collect that information and Shodan's another good tool to use during this phase 
I was doing a pen test several years ago as a full scope pen test, more of a an adversary simulation because everything was open, including physical and you know any kind of social engineering, any of that type of stuff. And so doing a look at look up and showdown topic, you know, uh, IP addresses and stuff, I was able to look up network blocks and find out IP addresses that were in scope. We only knew the address of the company, and the name of the company. So we had to really research to find any IP addresses to test. And during that test, I was able to find a FTP header on an FTP server that wasn't listed in any of those blocks. And how I found it is Shodan found like a banner for the HTTP for the FTP server and I was able to find that server. So that was a clear text FTP server on the internet. And so Shodan was able to find this. So your reconnaissance and your OSINT is very, very helpful going through uh, LinkedIn, different social media platforms, looking up information. So if you see openings for, you know, sysadmins or DevSecOps people, network people, then a lot of times you'll see what systems they're requiring you to understand so they're if they're a cisco shop they're going to be looking for cisco certifications or experience in different cisco products so you can go through there and find that information and possibly even find versions of the uh, software and stuff they're running as well as if you look up people that work for the company they may have in their in their job description all the things they do you know they want this populated because if they're in the market for a job or they're looking to upgrade then their information's out there. So sometimes they give a lot of detail. So this could be used during your pen test. So the more information you collect there, the better. And once you move on to the targets and you're on the network, your in-map scans and your vulnerability scans uh, can collect more information on those targets. So the more information you collect, the more chances you have of hacking into something. So this is kind of going from like, uh, you know, you look at the different types of target knowledge. And so if you look at more of an adversarial type simulation or a lot of your pen tests will, you'll have like IP addresses or a domain name and that's it. And you test from there. So the more information you collect on it, the more knowledge that you've got to attack that target. That's like if you took someone that works for the company doing internal pen tests, then they understand the environment better than, than a consultant would or a contractor come in and test the environment. So they've already collected information. So it's up to someone from the outside that's not part of that company to do a lot more manual collection to be able to, to test that system. And so there's different types of uh, open source intelligence. You have passive, semi-passive and active. So your passive is collecting from the sites like LinkedIn, something that's not touching that target. And then like Netcraft, semi-passive, you're starting to get into your, your DNS lookups and stuff. Uh, and really high level scans and you get into your active information gathering where you're doing your port scans and stuff. This kind of gets more into your reconnaissance and less away from OSINT specific. And so, so like we said, you know, collecting information is going to help you uh, be more successful on your, tar on your target. And that's one of the things too, if you're, if you're studying for the OSCP, one of the big things that people, uh, mess up on when they attempt the exam maybe they'll pass it the first time around is they didn't collect enough information so that's what you want to do so this this comes into play like in your vulnerability analysis we're doing more more of this information you're doing you're doing port scanning service scanning application os enumeration and vulnerability detection so while uh your vulnerability scanners like nexpose openvos and nessus find those vulnerabilities, it's also good to know how to manually collect that information. So how to, to manually detect those vulnerabilities, because there's times different one port, one vulnerability scanner will find something that another one doesn't and vice versa. And sometimes some manual tools will find things like Nikto, for instance, I've ran Nikto on several pen tests and it's a command line uh, tool for testing uh, web servers and web applications and I've been able to find like default credentials and stuff through one of those scans that, that Nessus didn't pick up. So the more tools you have, the better. So you want to use all tools available to you and keep an open mind, constantly learning, learning new things. And so vulnerability analysis, 
uh, you're looking at your for the network, you're looking at port and service scanning uh, with NMAP type on there. It should be NMAP, not NMAP, but NMAP and mass scan. Also, uh, the Metasploit framework, there's a lot of auxiliary scanners in there that you can do to look at look for anonymous FTP uh, and different vulnerable services. So that's a, that's a really good tool to have your disposal. disposal. It's not always about exploitation with Metasploit. There's a lot of discovery that you can do with that. And then your NSE scripts, your, your NMAP scripting engine scripts. Uh, the Vuln script in particular is nice because you're able to go through and run your scans. And what Vuln does is Vuln will run a script that looks for vulnerabilities and it'll actually look for the open source database vulnerability, open source vulnerability database numbers. So you can look up more information and possibly look up uh, exploits for those vulnerabilities. And then your vulnerability scanning is important. If you're doing a pen test, a lot of you hear people bef before they get into the industry, they think vulnerability scanning is cheating. But what happens on a, on a pen test is you don't have, you typically don't have enough time to do it all manually. So your, net, your vulnerability scanners, they're able to detect stuff easily. So you want the low hanging fruit, the stuff you can find quickly. That way you can get that out of the way and you can find some, some information there that you're able to focus your attacks closer. Like I said, the, the uh, manual testing is important as well, but you don't want to uh, rule out using your vulnerability scanners. And also for the web, there's, there's your dynamic application, your DAST, your dynamic application security testing scanners, which you, AppScan, WebInspect, Acunetics, Next, NetSparker, and Arachne, and the commercial version of, version of Burp Suite has a vulnerability scanner built in, as well as uh, OWASP Zap has a built-in vulnerability scanner for web application. Although, you know, the focus of this is network, when you're doing testing, the endpoint solutions companies are getting better about securing stuff, so uh, sometimes web or wireless are some of the, the uh, best ways to get in because sometimes the applications aren't as aren't as locked down so those are areas that you can try to uh, break into and then uh, burp and zap are also what you refer to as interception proxies you're able to intercept that traffic manipulate traffic and uh, you're able to take something and replay certain http requests and see if you get errors and those errors sometimes will give you information that leads to vulnerabilities that you can exploit that system. And then man in the middle proxy is another one. It's uh, basically a command line proxy, but that one you can monitor the the HTTP traffic as you're going along. And uh, also as far as along the lines to your, your Wireshark tools, running Wireshark where you're running a pen test, any kind of sniffers, T-Shark, to see any kind of, see the way things are reacting to your scanning on the network. And then some more of the open source tools you have out there, Nikto, as I mentioned, WP scan if you're scanning, if you're testing WordPress sites. And so this is a good tool. You actually can get database information, credentials. You can actually uh, brute force passwords, all sorts of good information there. And you'll find vulnerable plugins. And this is something that, you know, that a lot of times is a, is a good way to hack into a site if they're using WordPress due to insecure vulnerability, in, insecurity, uh, WordPress uh, plugins and then W3AF is another tool that's a command line vulnerability scanner. You can launch like the, the Java uh, interface to it, but it's kind of it sometimes can crash a lot, so it's kind of better at times to run the command line version of this. And when you're using W3AF, limit the amount of options you're doing, do your reconnaissance first. There's options that you do everything at once, and when you do that, the system gets overwhelmed and, and the application crash, crashes. So that one you just have to approach with, with uh, extreme care. And then SQL map is a good one for SQL injection. This is a really good tool for testing SQL injection. And if you're doing your vulnerability scans, if you find something, it's good to, to validate your vulnerabilities. Because when you're doing your vulnerability scans, you also want to make sure that you're doing uh, validation because a lot of times these scanners, they'll find false positives. So you want to go in and validate these, these vulnerabilities to make sure they're vulnerabilities before you try to exploit them. Once you validate them, then you can move on to the exploitation phase. And so SQL map is a good way to validate 
uh, your SQL injection vulnerabilities. And Durbuster, Derby, and GoBuster are, are good tools for discovering directories on a, a web server or a website. Sometimes there's information on there that they don't want exposed to the public. You can find administrative directories, files. Uh, you can find files on there that may contain, you know, configuration information or usernames and passwords. So going and looking through those directories, doing your directory brute forcing is a really good way to collect information for your pen test. And then exploitation, here's some good tools for your exploitation phase, exploit DB, you've gone through your vulnerability analysis, you found some vulnerable versions, then you go to, to exploit DB and you're able to go through and uh, look up exploits for that system. You do a search on the, the vulnerable operating system or software and it'll come back and you wanna make sure you put the vulnerability information in, I mean the, the version of the software and it'll come back with possible exploits. And there's also a command line version of that called Searchploit. It's a script that's on Kali Linux and other pen testing distros like, uh, like Parrot OS. And uh, it searches a, a hosted, a locally hosted repo of the exploit DB, the exploit database. So you're, you're able to, to access those exploits in your system because sometimes you're doing internal pen test you know, it gets tricky to download those exploits. You may have to connect through a mobile device that you have to, to download, go off their network and that sort of thing. But if you have them locally, then sometimes that can save you time and you can also search on your system for that exploit. And then the Metasploit framework, uh, we've mentioned before, uh, this is not manual. Some of the stuff's automated for it, but you can use it for manual and automated testing. And this is an exploit framework. And usually a lot of the popular exploits, uh, they're Rapid7, other people that support the community, uh, the application from a community standpoint will convert exploits over to, to a Metasploit module. So this is a really good place to, to look and sometimes you're easy, easy targets. And one of the things that, you know, some people want to avoid being a script kitty or they're worried about something being too automated and it's not leet, but one thing you gotta remember, if you're doing a pen test, you wanna find the vulnerabilities as quick as you can, use your time as, as best as possible. While you're learning this, you know, you wanna learn the manual and automated methods, but when you're on a test, then you wanna, your time's limited. Sometimes you may have a week to cover a lot of IP addresses. So the more you're able to, to make good use of your time, the better off you are. And plus, this is like one of the, there's, you don't have a lot of options out there when it comes to exploit frameworks. A lot of the other exploit frame frameworks like Core Impact, uh, those are not free and there's no, there's no free version or community version of it. So those are, can be pretty expensive. But if you're, you, you've got the luxury of your company, has got the luxury you do of having, using Nexpos and Metasploit together, then that kind of, uh, they work Kind of hand in hand. So if you find something in Nexpos, you're able to more easily exploit it with Exploit Pro, with Metasploit Pro. So uh, those are good options there. So sometimes automating things, even writing scripts to automate some of your tasks, like your in-map scans, uh, there's different tools out there you can use to do that with, uh, like the Unicorn Scan or Magic Unicorn by Trusted Sec. It helps automate some of your tasks as well. Okay, now we'll try to see if I can get my lab up and running here. Hey, Philip, quick question for you. There's been a lot of yeah. uh, que uh, questioning and kind of clamoring for any links. Is there anything they need to download, anything that we, we need to, to get to them while, while we're going through this? Yeah, I wasn't, the VMs aren't up there, but what I'm gonna do is I'm going to cover the tools and once I get it uploaded, then I, or actually what we're using, if you have Metasploitable 3 set up, that's what I'm using, Metasploitable 2 and 3 are the vulnerable VMs I'm gonna use. So that, and if they got Kali Linux, if they don't have that, I know a lot of people have run into trouble creating the Metasploit 3 uh, VM, it's built on Windows. And uh, 
So there's a script out there to build it with, but I will share that VM later. So okay. really what we're gonna do here is more or less kind of give you an overview of the tools and then give you access to point in the right direction of the stuff you need to, to, to uh, practice on your own time. Awesome, thank you, sir. Oh, you're welcome, thanks. Okay. I'm trying to get my lab up here running real quick so we can. So we're not seeing any, only thing we're seeing on screen is end of slideshow, click to exit. Yeah, that's that's fine. I'm, I'm trying to get my, my lab connecting here at home. Okay, perfect. I didn't know if you were sharing desktop. Yeah, everybody stand by for a minute or two here while uh, Philip gets his uh, presentation or the uh, VMs up and, and start showing us that. Anybody else have any questions, uh, feel free to ask it here or ask it in the Discord channel. Yeah, sometimes these live demos. Did did you do did you do your proper sacrifices to the demo gods? I don't think I I don't think I sacrificed enough chickens. Oh no. <laughs> we'll we'll hope that they're not looking today. How about that? Okay. Yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, what happened was my lab I have set up at home was updating and rebooted and one of the network card wireless network cards wasn't working so I had to plug in a USB wireless card to get this set up so we should, looks like it made things may cooperate fingers crossed fingers toes whatever you need to cross cross it yeah one of the things I've decided in the future is to set up cloud instances of stuff instead because uh, yeah. <laughs> Yep, I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. That it makes never, it easier for and never update before a demo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's uh the advantage of putting some stuff online too makes it easier. People don't have to download it. So there's sites like Try Hack Me that you can put stuff on and people can do it virtually online. Yeah. Someone said hail to the demo gods. Absolutely. All right, so a couple of questions out here. Obviously, nothing on screen right now. We know this. We are in the process of fixing it. Um, Cali 2020.2 uh, uh, has Metasploit 5.0.8.7 was a comment. Um, there's also another comment here about what is the YouTube channel. Um, so I'll go ahead and post that into uh, you know into the link uh, into the link, but we should be able to get that that to everyone as well. Okay, well I'll go ahead and yeah, it's if you go to pwnschool.com there's a link on there for for the youtube channel what is that pwnschool.com school.com yeah perfect Okay. 
It looks like we got to be in to cooperate. <laughs> and one of the things I've kind of discovered here recently, if anyone's doing any any kind of uh, wireless pen testing or getting into that, if you're trying to get the alpha card to work and if it's not working, uh, I was noticing recently preparing for a pen test, a wireless pen test, that uh, that SANS uses the Buffalo cards, not Buffalo, Panda cards. Mm -hmm. And so I'm finding out that these alpha cards are getting more difficult to to use, that the, the drivers don't work. And some of the newer ones, I'd use like an older alpha card the other day and found out also now that if you're doing wireless pen testing, really Parrot OS is the way to go. Yep. Okay, let's see. So we do have a question in um, in Discord. So to be clear, we need Metasploitable uh, 2 slash 3 and a Kali VM. So that's kind of what you recommend? Yes, that's what I recommend. Perfect. Okay, so let's see, we got this to come up here. And as far as virtualization, VMware in, uh, VMware or VirtualBox works good, but I can, one of my advice to give you if you're doing anything Anything wireless related using VMware works a lot more seamlessly. When you connect your USB devices, it'll prompt you to connect. Whereas VirtualBox, you have to do a little more work to get that to work. So if it's uh, an option for you, then then I would go with VMware. But you can get by with a lot. Of, I was using it for quite a while without using VirtualBox, and even for my class at Richland College. Okay, so we. Can we can you see my screen? Yep, we can. Okay. Yeah, one of the kind of the changes with the latest version of Kali 2 is not working as a, a root user, but if you get tired of typing in passwords, you can do like I did just there, because I'm actually using Paris Parrot for this uh, demo. But yeah, if you use like sudo space su for switch user, then you'll it'll let you run everything as root. If you don't want to do this in any other kind, if you're a blue team or you don't want to, of course, you know that you don't want to do that on your systems. Got one of my, so what we're going to do here is the first one we're going to do, we're going to, yeah, I was going to run it. I was going to run a net discover, but I'm not going to map out my whole network over the internet. So uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to run in map against our target could be the first thing we do here. And Metasploitable 2 is what we're going to be targeting. And, and part of the reason I picked these, these VMs is as you're learning, try to, to hack on your own. But if you get stuck, there's walkthroughs out there. So I kind of encourage you to go through the walkthroughs. So maybe you start out with, with uh, Metasploitable 2, work through that. And and if you need help, do walkthroughs. Then when you move on to Metasploitable three, try to do it without as much help, because sometimes you know if you just don't, you're not you know getting it. Then uh, you know seeing the way other people do it and seeing some of the walkthroughs, you can find multiple ways of doing it. So we're going to do a service scan as well, and we're going to, the NSE scripts I mentioned. We're going to do actually go through a test for the default scripts, which is this this syntax right here. And then we're going to use a script and the Vuln script that I mentioned is a good one for that. We're going to set the time and basically I'm doing this to speed up our scan a little bit. Once you start, it goes up to like T5 or T6. Once you get above T4, you start losing some of the accuracy. You may miss something. So you don't want to scan too fast. And then when 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 your your network scan your vulnerability scans you want to be careful because I did a pen test one time using mass scan because they were there was a huge number of IP addresses to scan and I got a little too anxious too aggressive with the scans and rebooted a couple of firewalls so you want to be careful when you're using mass scan or and also you know kind of be careful in map especially if you're testing any kind of uh, ICS environments 
your OT, you know, your operation technology environments for ICS. So you want to be careful with that. So you don't crash anything. It's a good way to get people mad at you. It's kind of funny. I did a, a pen test one time and I uh, was doing my my mass scans and rebooted a couple of firewalls. And so I got babysit for the rest of the pen test, which ended up not being a bad thing because I made a friend out of it. The guy was really interested in pen testing. So it ended up making the pen test more fun because this was a, a pen test that required working after hours. So I'd work from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. So at least it was good I had someone to, to talk to. So, so we got our syntax out of here. And so we're going to output the nmap scan to a file. People are saying they can't hear you. They can't hear? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Uh, I'm on the phone, but I don't know. Some of the people are saying they can't hear you. Yeah, I think people are going to need to connect up and out because I'm going across uh, voice over IP as well. So um, I'm not on the phone. So it's it's working that way. I think people just need to reconnect their sessions. Yeah, refresh browser, refresh the the client if you have any problems with audio. Okay. Not that they would have heard any of what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can put it in the chat, everybody. Yeah. So anyway, we're the, we get our so this this dash OA outputs to the three three different three different popular uh, file formats for Nmap. You get the regular nmap output. So when you cat the file, open up the file, it's going to look like it did on the console. And there's the greppable format that makes it easier to grep for for different items within your scan. It could be a really long scan. You need to do that. And then there's the XML version. So with the XML or okay. sorry about interrupting you, but um, okay. a couple of the people are saying they hear you just fine. So these are individual okay. problems. If you're okay. having a problem hearing, obviously you're not hearing me say this. But I did put it in the, <laughs> I did put it in the uh, in the chat, and I will put it in the other in the Discord chat, and I'll stop interrupting you. That's okay. <laughs> Not a problem. I'd rather make sure people get such situated. So we're gonna run our scan here against our target, and this is metasploitable too. An interesting thing about Nmap, this is a pretty good tool, even if you're doing. Uh, you're, you like C, to do CTFs. Sometimes CTFs will have information on that target that you can get through Nmap. Sometimes systems, I don't think, intentionally do this, but some captures of flags will put information in, in Nmap, the, in, the, in the system in a way that Nmap is able to enumerate that. So we didn't set the verbosity, so we set it to one, so this is given smart. Okay, so. And we just did just a default scan. You can do like a full 600 and, or 6,000, port, all TCP ports. You can do all that, scan all those ports. And sometimes you can find things you might not otherwise find, but just kind of for not waiting, being bored forever looking at a, uh, in map scan that we're going to see it. So we're seeing so open ports and you can also add like a, a uh, open tag to it. So you'll, so it only outputs the open information. So you can increase the verbosity on up to get more information as it goes along. And so if anyone's looking for a really good book to get started in pen testing, Georgia Weedman's book is great. She's working on an update. And one of the things people, you know, this is the information you gain from this book, you'll still be able to, to learn. So it's kind of, you know, the book's kind of older but you can still learn from it because hacking a system is is hacking a system basically you're going to use different vulnerabilities and different techniques on on uh 
on your operating systems. Is there a chat feature in here? Okay. And that's the book right there in case anyone needs it, you can share that out if you would please. So that's a really good book to get started with. That's what I used the first week, first year of my pen testing class. And we ended up moving to the pen test plus later on because it gave students a, a certification to, to uh, study for to get a certification. And certifications are good when you're getting your foot in the door of pen testing. You don't necessarily have to, to have certifications, but it definitely helps when you're getting in. So we're able to see, so we see Matilda Day on here. So that's one of the vulnerable web apps. So there's some, that's the good thing about the vulnerable VMs like Metasploitable. They have so many different vulnerabilities on there that you're able to, to exploit on there. So, I mean, it's typically what you, typically what you see on Metasploitable 2 or Metasploitable 3 would be like multiple vulnerable VMs. So this is not gonna take up as much disk space and you've got different things to test against. And so you look through here, so what this, uh, that Vuln script does, it'll find these types of items right here. So we're seeing a CVE for this, for this particular vulnerability. So this is a, a Diffie-Helms export cipher downgrade man and mental logjam vulnerability. And so you can look up these CVEs and get more information. Let's see, his vulners here, I believe they're actually the ones that creates this vuln script. So you can go to this site and you can go through and look for that vulnerability. And I tell you what, I've not really, I hadn't used Paris, Parrot OS up until here recently, but it's a really, really good operating system especially for people that are privacy minded if you just want like a an operating system to just surf the internet and be safe it's got a lot of privacy stuff built in because there's just a, a just a standalone parrot os without all the pen testing tools in it but then there's also the version with the pen test tools in it so those of you that aren't familiar here's uh the exploit DB, exploit database. We can actually go through and look up our vulnerabilities through that, or we can use search exploit, which I'll show you here in just a minute. So here, here's a version of OpenSSH. I think they've gotten a little better they may still have the captures on the exploit DB website. Come back here. And so here we get in here and we can see the different vulnerabilities. Post this, paste this back up so I can see what version because. So you can go through there and find your vulnerabilities here. And some of them, if you look through, uh, a lot of times you're going to find, you'll see platform and it'll have Metasploit. So some of these are direct Metasploit modules that you can find in there. Any of these in here, this is not the exact version, but you can you can see the exploits you can download. This is a Python script, so some of these okay. require them to be compiled. And so these file these you can download, or they're actually in within uh, exploit and exploit DB databases on your system to use search search exploit to look for. And so we see the different platforms that these run on, and some of these are PHP. And some of these will show up Ruby. Typically, most cases, the Ruby modules are, or uh, 
for Metasploit. So I'll share, since I mentioned the different file formats. <clears throat> so we see the, different, the three different file more, formats I mentioned. It helps when you spell things right. And so here we see what the grippable format looks like. So this is useful if you're trying to grip through looking for certain things. And if you just do the regular nmap format, then we see exactly the output the way we saw it on, during that scan as the scan was happening. And X of the XML format is really handy for importing into different tools because Dratus is one of the one of the tools out there that you can it's a report generation and pen test collaboration tool, and you can import all of your scans into it. And uh, so you can see it's got these tags on there. Get it? If you have the right kind of plugins, you can open it up in your browser, and it gives you a nice view of the 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 pen test or the the uh, results of your scan, and it's kind of color coded and stuff, which is kind of nice. And there's some tools you can some tools you can convert it, convert it to HTML as well. And so like your grippable format or any of these other formats, you can go through We can grip open to look for open ports. And so this shows us all the open ports. And so you can get really fancy with your scripting and, and create scripts to pull out information just on certain certain protocols and stuff. And so here, while well, we got this screen open in a vulnerability here, search split. Interesting. I just assumed that search exploit would be on Parrot. Okay, let's see if this has something. <clears throat> They've got a. Hmm, guess maybe they call it something else different on here. But on Kali Linux, you just type in search exploit in the name. Now, this must be some kind of GUI tool. Okay, they don't have it, which is probably a way to install it on here and these other scripts. There's some other scripts I've seen out there too that combine more than the exploit DB together. But typically what you would do is just type in search exploit. Tell you what I'll do here is I will.
So here you can kind of see an example that search exploit, you put in the terms and it will come back with a list of, of vulnerabilities and you're able to go through and, and look those up. And so it's a good idea to have this updated. So when you're out on a pen test, if, you know, it's kind of hard to get connection to the internet due to the, some of the controls in the environment, then having that up to date is good. So let's see if there's, Okay, and here's this uh, VS FTPD backdoor. And so here's, there's another, this is another good site. This was like one of the first ones I used to use when I was getting getting started in pen testing was security focus. Now they're on by Symantec. This Ruby, it looks like it probably be a Metasploit module. We can search here in vulnerabilities as well. So we're going to use this. So when you find an exploit you want to use, just use exploit. need to do show options to see what all we need to make this work. So we need the R hosts. So this you can do several at the same time. So we're going to use and regardless if it's one host or more, you still have to use the R host command. Okay, so show exploits. So we need a payload for this. So there's only one.
exploit completed, but no session created. Okay, so sometimes you have to try it more than once. So we tried exploit again, so we got a shell to it. And so one of the, whenever you're doing the, when you're exploiting a system, if you can get a interpreter session, that is the best. Because right here we've got access to the system. There he is. Okay, so you're not getting, so the shell that, this is not interactive. Sometimes you can make shells interactive by putting in a string of Python code, which I don't know if this would is would help with would allow us to do that or not. But CID. So we see that we're accessing that system as root. We can also, who am I? The thing I like about I, ID is when it gets the the UID, it will give you like more information to group it's in and stuff as well. Sometimes who am I works typically on Linux systems and so in most newer Windows systems. So we're able to get onto that system. So we see that that is vulnerable. So we're able to see the Etsy password file, which years ago in Unix and Linux, they used to have like, they would have the password in here too. But now this is just basically shows you the, the different users and the groups they are in and, and where their shell starts and all that. So you're able to go through, it's good information if you need a, you know, a possible target to, to exploit that system, you know, some other users that you can try to exploit. So doubt this is gonna work, but we'll try Etsy shadow. Ooh, so we actually get the shadow file. So you could actually take, see, these are the hashes. These are the actual hashes of of those passwords so you could take these hashes and crack the hashes. So a lot of cases you sometimes typically you'll have sometimes you'll have access to Etsy password but not usually Etsy shadow. So this would have been a good one here. So whenever you're working on this on your own go through and use John Ripper or Hashcat and try to crack the hashes on there. So we see here, we found a vulnerability. We were able to validate that it is vulnerable and exploit it. So this is where you would put your screenshots into your, into your report showing the access you have and who you're accessing it as. A lot of times what I like to do is to prove on the system if it's a command line, I'll do, a lot of times we'll do if config in there too. So you have to spell it right. So that it gives that information, then you got the IP address associated with it. So that way you can prove what system that you're on. Then while you're doing doing your pen test, it's a good idea to use a note taping taking tool to keep track of what you're finding. So you don't want to lose all this information. So you may see something you want to record it so you can go back and look at it later. So that's one of the reasons you want to save your in-map output to file 
I don't see a list down here, but there's like Cherry Tree and Joplin. Keep Note was one of the older version. Joplin's really nice. It's pretty, pretty similar to Evernote and OneNote. So you could sit there and put like a in in your your notes. You would create like a a node or a folder for each each one of the IPs you're testing, and then you would take like your Nmap output, create a node for Nmap. And there's also two we can. We'll go here and we'll look at some web services and see what we have to scan here. <clears throat> okay, port 80 is open, so, so we're gonna run Nikto. And so here we're able to see this ring Apache 2.2.8. So you can look up and see if there's any vulnerabilities for that. It's also using WebDAV. WebDAV, if it's not secure, that allows you to upload files to a system. So you're able to possibly upload a, a shell to that system and execute it or any kind of exploit code that you need. And so as these scans go along, they're showing the session this PHP session says potentially sensitive information. So this is, they'll tell you, and so you can look up this open source vulnerability database ID for that information on that. And so we see that this is an outdated version. So this would be something for your pen test report, whether you could exploit it or not, is it showing this version of Apache is outdated. So the, it says current version is 2.4. Four dot three seven. So this you'd, and then this is checking different HTTP methods, HTTP trace, and HTTP. So this is there's some vulnerabilities around trace, but the ones you really want to look for is your 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 puts and deletes. So if you can do puts and deletes, you can actually upload and delete files off the system. So we also see that PHP my admins on there. So this is probably Good possibility that that's vulnerable because it's used for, used for managing MySQL databases. So if it's not even, if login is not enforced, you could go in there and possibly get some information on the system. And part of a pen test too, it's not all about getting root. Sometimes it's about the information. It's all the time about the information. They could be customer information there, proprietary company information that you don't want to get in the hands of someone else. So you want to make sure it's protected. So, you know, if you don't have to get domain admin to get that information, that's a, a or, you know, even administrator or any kind of restricted access, that, that's definitely a, a finding. So credit card numbers, personal information, intellectual property, that kind of stuff is is the goal that the, the malicious actors are act after. So we see some different vulnerabilities here. So uh, web dev may be, and there used to be, a, there's a tool called Cadaver that's really good for uploading files to WebDAV.
And another really good tool, I'm not gonna run it here, but um, Responder is a really good tool for, for collecting, uh, sniffing information on your, your NTLM traffic and, and inter intercepting that and, and possibly cracking hashes with it, intercepting hashes, such so, so as basically a responder. And so yeah, test for LLM and R. Uh, and you can, this is interesting too, because you can set, you just, once you set this up on a network, I did a pen test back a couple of years ago, a side pen test, and I was able to collect like 53 password hashes, and I was able to crack one of the hashes. And with the hashes too, you don't necessarily have to crack them, you can do pass the hash. So several different tools like crack map exec that you can use to pass the hash. And so we see Matilda on here. So there's a lot of good web stuff on here that you can you can hack on. Okay, so we're able to get to this. So we see the PHP MyAdmin. As well, we see damn vulnerable web app and web dev on here. <clears throat> and so you come here, you actually see the, the login for, for Metasploitable. There's nothing there, just Matilda. And go here and there's all sorts of stuff you can test against. So the thing that's nice about this, this Metasploitable is you can attack this like you found a system on the network that's got web services. So whatever you can exploit there could end up giving you command line access like we have through Meterpreter. So you may be able to get that through the web layer. And all these things are, in, you see all these apps that are installed in here. So there's a good chance there's probably some kind of vulnerable. So you got damn vulnerable web app. This is another good one to work on your web hacking skills. And so you can see here, we got the login information. We have Pro FTPD. Go back here and look at our version, make sure we get the right version. So some here you see the ranges. So we tried to go directly to the version information, but if we scroll down towards the bottom of the page, we can see that this is some of these could be vulnerable up to, let's see, there is vulnerable up to 3.1. No, but there's ranges. So sometimes you have to kind of look through because it won't go to the to the exact version.
don't know about y'all, but I'm not a big fan of the captures. Sometimes you feel like you've got everything in there and you just <laughs> miss something. Okay, now the browser is just Bear with me, my screen is locked up here. It's not liking this VM, or the VM's not liking this page. So Discord's blowing up. Everybody's uh, totally feeling your pain right now with this CAPTCHA nightmare. So just want to okay. throw that out there. There's a lot of people <laughs> that are uh, rooting for you. <laughs> Man, they really got these things made that I don't even, good gosh, same as CAPTCHAs anymore are just crazy. Well, my screen kind of like got locked up. <laughs> yeah, it's straight up torture. Somebody said there's probably a bus in the sky you're missing. Yeah, that's just crazy. I mean, I don't know how, I mean, my gosh. I guess they figure if security, if it's a security site, they frustrate the bad guy enough that they'll just give up and not hack the site. Well, most most secure site is one you can't get to, period. Yeah. That's true. All right, so just to uh, make sure everyone knows, we're, we're still on, everything's still going. He's just resetting. Yeah, I'm going to have to.
reset this VM, which is not going to. But everybody else knows this is real world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you start doing pen testing, you are going to run into some weird problems. Let me tell you. That's right. I can tell you in general, I've been having a bad tech week. It seems like anything technology wise is just being a challenge. So there was a couple of questions out here. Maybe I can throw a couple at sure. you while you're going through this. Um, okay. There was a question. Somebody was having some problems with how long it took for Searchploit to pop back some results. Um, and they were talking about, uh, do you have to use sudo when do, using Searchploit? Just didn't know what your thoughts were. I don't believe you have to use sudo for the newer version. No, nah, because I've used the newer version and I've used it and it has it. It could be just maybe there's just a lot of of information is trying to pull back that or either they may need to do an update. Maybe maybe the exploit DB is corrupted or something. Yeah. Well, it's just files, but I would say maybe that I would update some, see if you can, there, you can update to just do a, an apt update and it'll update everything for you. Gotcha. And then one other one was um, specific arguments on Nmap. Now, I know, I know you don't have a command line in front of you, but uh, uh, somebody was asking if you can go over what the arguments that you were using. Um, Cause I know she meant you yeah. were talking about the T4, you know, that you didn't want to go much more above that. Cause it would, uh, it's too fast and you get weird results. Just, you know, I don't know if that's something you, you could throw off the top of your head. Yeah. T, T4 is, is going to be, it controls the speed. You can go up to, I think it goes up to T6, but once you start getting above T4, then you start running into, you'll start missing stuff. So you, you don't want to miss any ports or anything. And then the I did the dash PN, which is to not probe. And mm -hmm. I do that by default because a lot of times when you do an in-map scan, you don't get information back. It'll come back and say, if you did use dash PN, you might be able to find something. Otherwise, you're not finding it. So I use that by default. Dash uh, lowercase s, uppercase V is for the version. And then the dash lowercase S uppercase C is for the default scripts. So what it does is Nmap as it's scanning, it will go through whatever services it finds. It'll run the NSC scripts against that. So if it's mm -hmm. finding a lot of HTML related, HTTP related stuff, then it'll run more stuff against that. If it's if it's Windows, then it'll start throwing some SMB related stuff at it. Uh, so that's what that that does. And then the the script that I ran with it, the dash 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 script space vuln it looks for the specific vulnerabilities and gives us the open source vulnerability database or cves for those vulnerabilities and then dash oa is uh just the uh adapter that's for the output output so yeah you, you output to a file and it's lowercase o and uppercase a and that gives you the three formats that gives you uh the, the nmap format, grippable format, and the XML. And the XML format's good because you can import it into other tools, like Dratus is one of the one of the tools that you can do. Um, you know, it's used to create reports as well as uh, collaborate with other pen testers. Gotcha. Thanks for that. Oh, you're welcome. So we can go back, and that's one of the nice things about when you run your scripts. So like if you're system crashes <laughs> and then you got your nmap output so we can go back and look at those files that's one of the reasons you'll save the files and also another good thing too is if you're running something and you're you're doing a network pen test or you're using a remote system the screen command is good to use because what the screen does is if you're using a remote system you're ssh into another system or remotely connected and you're running a scan and if it dies, you lose everything. But if you use the screen command, you can go back and reconnect as long as the server didn't crash. Let's see here. And uh, last one, uh, just while you're popping some stuff up, uh, okay. um, what do you recommend as a solid methodology slash standard for reporting findings? Uh, let's see. This the CVVE the CVV database out there you can actually risk it, it rates the risks of the vulnerabilities 
it maps the vulnerabilities. That would be good but as far as methodology, the PTES standard there. But like the, I think it's CV, CVV. There's the, that's the usually what they use to rank the vulnerabilities. Let me see if I get anything to come up. Tell you what, we have to let this sit for a while, but maybe bring up a browser and. Here's the book I was talking about earlier that's a good one to get started with. Okay, yeah, the CVSS, CVSS scoring. See, so come to the CVE details. This is a good way to score rank risk your vulnerabilities. And with the web app, it's that the OWASP makes it pretty nice because OWASP gets, has that out there. And so, yeah, you can see, so go through. I think there's like, should be something here to let you score your findings. So there's like a C, so yeah, you can use the CV, CVSS score and I think version three is the latest version. So that's a good one to score on that. So what are your thoughts on how much networking you need to know to be successful in doing these types of pen tests? Yeah, you know, as far as uh, like based on, re referred to certs, and here's kind of a, a good thing to follow. If you're starting out new and you don't have experience in IT or technology, then I would start with something like the A+, learn the operating systems, and then go to the, like the network plus. But as far as networking goes, mainly your targets are typically going to be servers, workstations, any kind of computing system on a network. And so it, having a sysadmin level of technical ability, I would say would be good to achieve because that means, you know, you're going on your Linux system or your Windows system and you're able to connect to networks and you're able to understand like basic routing. So if you're not able to connect to a system, you can do trace routes to see where you're missing out. And, you know, the, some of those things that like the command line is good to know as far as like Windows and Linux, because if you get a shell to a system and you don't know the command line, you're gonna be doing a lot of Googling and it's gonna slow down what you need to do. So if you know the command line, then you could possibly shut down firewalls, uh -huh. uh, do different sysadmin level commands on a system. But as far as networking goes, uh, you don't necessarily have to know Cisco, although if you were to breach a Cisco system, then it would be important to know, but you know, just your basic networking, be able to connect, you know, systems on a network and, you know, set up your, your network configurations on devices that you're using and devices you connect to. So you don't have to go out, be full blown, you know, elite level Cisco, you know, you don't have to be a CCIE, but just something all lines is of like, you go out to like Professor Messer, he's got a lot of videos out there. And I know someone, actually one of the best pen testers I know when he started out, you know, he didn't, he didn't give the, have the opportunity to take uh, SANS courses and stuff. So what he did was he went through like Professor Messer, he built VMs, was learning like Security Onion and all that, all those different uh, platforms to learn networking. But he went through like the Professor Messer videos to learn networking and operating systems 
in security because you got the security plus and network plus mm -hmm. you don't have to have those certifications but having that knowledge is is helpful and so you get you really just kind of give you you know an idea you know you need to be able to understand the technology to secure the technology and to break into the technology so you have to under you need to know the security and the technology and you have to know everything there's the this field is pretty broad there's a lot of things to learn but as long as once you get a good base knowledge then you can expand those concepts and learn other areas yeah that's the key the foundation is so crucial layer two through four you know understanding ports understanding you know how layer two networks operate and, and some of the different protocols i mean that's that's really the the foundation that everything builds on yes yeah that is not coming back up on this so next time more chickens yeah more chickens well yeah, next. <laughs> yeah. I, one of the things that's gonna that'll help for next time is I'm trying to get away from the labs that we use at the college where I teach. And uh, so I'm trying to get away from those because I have to have someone else set those up for each semester. So if I want any updates to it, I don't have access to update stuff. And so uh, I'm thinking about doing something, putting the stuff in the cloud to manage myself. Mm. So that way, in that way, plus I was looking at uh, try hack me to set up labs on the future. Then at workshops, people have access directly to it, and they don't have to. So here's some different stuff out here on uh, some different resources. If you go to my website, there's some different books and stuff out there. And yeah, like the penetration. Penetration testing, a hands-on introduction to hacking. I would start out with that. And then like the hacker playbook two and three, I'd graduate to that next. Mm -hmm. And with version, don't skip version two because version three gets into more red teaming and you'll miss out on some of the network pen testing pieces there. And then the web application hackers handbook is great for web application pen testing. And then the red team field manual is a good resource for different command line syntax and stuff around Cisco and Windows and Linux and some of the different tools. And these are some different resources I hear. The first, these first ones up here are not free, mm -hmm. but they rank from the most expensive down to the less, least expensive. And here are some free resources, uh, especially if you're interested in bug bounties, bug crowd and, and hacker one have good resources for learning web app pen testing. And then the, the, uh, the SANS pen test blog if you go there, they've got cheat sheets on Nmap. So you go out there, sign up to their, you'll get, you'll get, start getting their, their brochures in the mail. But then you, once a year, they put out this pen testing poster and it's got like different tools or different techniques and stuff. So that's a good place there. Uh, this hackingtutorials.org, this is a really good place for learning like Nmap and stuff like that. I mean, it's like Nmap and Metasploit. Mm. So here you see some of the different hacking tutorials. So you see up here, they got wireless, they got like Metasploit. Mm -hmm. So this is different tutorials on how to use the different tools. So that's a really good place to to learn. Yeah, I think I think one of the most important things, and and because I get this all the time about people that are constantly saying, okay, well, how do I start? Because they get so overwhelmed. And yeah. you know, I think that that the the most important thing to understand is just don't get overwhelmed. Try to find a bite size amount, build yourself a plan. And start tackling yeah. these topics. You know, start small. Start with something that you can get access to that's free, and then start building your your base of knowledge. You know, it might take yeah. you a few years to get there, but if you do it methodically, you you will get there. Yeah, build build a home lab, and that's pretty simple as running some VMs on your your local system, or you can you know get as complex as you want. But a home lab, getting the hands on is good experience, and like you said, learn in small pieces that way you, you you absorb it because one of the things i see a lot of times is people want and the, another thing is is plan your goals out have short-term and long-term goals if you want to be a pen tester i don't ever discourage anyone from not doing it because some people come up and you know they need you know they need a little more skills a little more knowledge and so i just encourage them because you some people i know that 
their very first job in security or technology was pen testing. That's not going to happen all the all the time. Right. But it can be done if you want to work hard enough. But it's you know, like anything in security or technology, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Mm-hmm. So you just have to kind of start out and you and just continue to learn, and you'll get there. And just be patient with yourself too. Some people are not patient. You just have to be patient. It takes a while to learn. Once you've seen something taught several times over, then you're going to, you know, next time you see it, someone explains it different or you've got a better understanding. So the more times you see it, the better you understand it. So you just have to give yourself patience and give yourself time. That's exactly right. You got to fight the burnout because that, that's something that we struggle with in technology. It can seem so overwhelming, but if you take it in bite-sized chunks, you build yourself a plan, you'll get there. Yeah. Sometimes unplug from it. If you've been studying too hard, take a break. I mean, you you see these coding challenges, a hundred days of code, that's good and you'll learn, but you just can't stay busy 365 days a year forever. You've got to take a break every now and then, or you get to where you hate it. So that's you have right. to take, take your breaks and So yeah, it's just, yep, and just build that base because the better you learn it, the better. And a good example that I can give that I share with my students each semester since I heard about this, I know a guy that he was a reverse engineer. He went to work as a pen tester and he took assembly in college, but he just did enough to pass the class. He didn't learn it. So Mm -hmm. now working in the industry, he had to go back and learn assembly. Oh, that's awesome. So it's like if he would have done it then, so that's what I tell students, you know, if they're, if you're going through college, you know, your art appreciation, if you're going to be in security or music appreciation may not help you. But, you know, your 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 networking classes, your operating system classes, your Python coding classes, this is stuff you're going to use. Try to learn it because it's you're spending the time to do it and it, it'll come in helpful later on. What do you think about uh, and what's your view uh, on the best entry level pen test ter- uh, cert? Um, EJ. PT or Pentest Plus or those those any that you think are, are worthwhile? EJPT, I think, is I, I like better because you're doing hands-on. Mm-hmm. So you'll get to learn. The e-learning security uh, courses are really good. But yeah, I would do that because you're going to actually learn how to do a pen test. Your CEH and Pentest Plus, uh, Pentest Plus, pen, the uh, CEH focuses a lot on tools and not really necessarily doing pen test the thing i like about pen test plus is it gets more into to methodology uh-huh. and the, uh, you know it's not just the tools which pen test plus between that you're trying to learn pen testing between P, pen test plus and ch you're going to learn more from the pen test plus but the ej the ejpt that's a good one to start with because you're going to learn you're going to learn pen testing so you actually do you know pen testing in the course so that's that's a really good one to start with I've known people that have started out with that, that that was their path into becoming OSCPs. Mm-hmm. They started out with the EJPT and then studied a little bit and then went on to like the OSCP. The OSCP is a good start. One of the things I'll say too is get a little experience, learn this before you get into that. You'll learn real, uh, you'll learn a lot in that class, but there's good if you don't have the basics, get that built up first before you start it because it's not an entry level cert. Some people will say it's, one thing is that some people say it's entry level pen test, but that's when you compare it to like pen test plus or CH is not really. But as far as, you know, someone that's experienced pen tester, it's not as difficult. But I've seen people with, you know, self-taught, no formal education in technology, do the OSCP, work hard on it and, and get through it. So if you're wanting to do that, you don't have experience, definitely spend some time with the EJPT uh-huh. and some of these other courses and labs and stuff before you go on yeah i think the certs are very valuable just in just from the perspective of it's a learning path you know and regardless yeah. of what your thoughts are on certs and you know experience versus thir- certs experience always trumps um but yeah. certs are a great way to build a learning path and also to be able to show you know some credibility if, if unless you already you know have your name out there kind of thing yeah it's gonna you definitely got definitely helps to get your foot in the door otherwise it's hard to get your foot in the door without the cert because you got no experience you know, how do you get in? So usually right. the certs get you in there and, you know, it's going to depend on the employer. Some people I really haven't been seeing for pen testing 
a requirement for degrees. Some people look for certifications. The ones I hear most, see most often is like the OSCP, OSCE, the GPIN from SANS or the, the GXPN from SANS or the SANS GWAPT. Those, once you're in it, but as far as entry level, you know, CEH will get your foot in the door. And if companies are doing uh, business with the government, then, you know, the CEH as well as like the CISSP or on the DOD right. list of certs. That's and right. Sometimes the requirements to get contracts. So having those sometimes can get your foot in the door. It's not necessarily going to help you be a better pen tester, but it's a matter about getting your foot in the door. Yep. Agreed. Well, I'm going to give up on the, the demo that we can just continue on with questions. Anyone has questions? Otherwise. That sounds good. So um, go ahead and pop into the questions on uh, the webinar. So if you can just okay. go to the Q&A and pop in a question, I'll make sure that, uh, that we get it answered. I've been trying to keep uh, an eye on what's going on in Discord as well. Um, there was a comment in Discord, if you're not seeing it, that the EJ, EJPT is actually on sale right now. Um, so they're okay. offering some uh, some discounts on that. So, you know, when in quarantine, start training. And the one of the things I'll, I'll, I'll say compared to, because I've taken I've taken courses through uh, through Pentester Academy. Those are really good courses, and they've got stuff that fits all level. They really try to cater towards people getting started. Make sure that there's content there for them. But one of the things I'll say, like the the uh, e-learn security, the EJPT, compared to like offensive security, if you're just getting started out, the Pentester Academy. I mean the the um, e-learn security stuff goes into more detail than like the OSCP. So they, it's like, you know, with the, they've improved on the OSCP, they've added more detail to it and used to before you definitely, even if you had experience, you'd need to prep up front before taking the class, but they go into a lot of good detail. So it's like, if you've got like zero pen testing experience or you don't have people to talk to about it, it takes you from the beginning and explains in enough detail with, with hands-on labs. So it's a really good play, way to get started. That's awesome. Well, it doesn't look like I have uh, any more questions popping up through here. So um, last chance guys on uh, guys and, and gals and, and uh, you know, everyone out there, please uh, pop in some questions. Uh, but if not, uh, unless you had something else. <laughs> yeah, people can reach me on Twitter. I just gave you my Twitter account, my Twitter, not my account, my, <laughs> yeah, don't give me your what account. You, nah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what you'll see. <laughs> also, they can reach me on LinkedIn too. And I really, I, you know, this is kind of how I got started, started into teaching and and doing conference stuff was uh, just from you know sharing information. So if anyone wants to, you know, has any questions later on after this, oh, with feel free to message me on LinkedIn. I do a lot of answering questions and referring people to information and stuff. So there's, there's one question we just got on discord. Any advice for someone finishing school in the next few years, projects, ideas to work on in their free time? Yeah. If you're in college, try to get, see if you can get in, get an internship because that's one thing I've seen that's help people get their foot in the door. Uh, also maybe, you know, bug bounties are good. If you're interested in, See, some of the bug bounties, they offer more than just web. Some of them have mobile, IoT, and automobile vehicle uh, bug bounties. So that's kind of a way to get started, get experience. But yeah, the internships, if you can do that, that's a really good way to get started. Because the biggest thing when you get out in the, the field, a lot of people I see that didn't get internships, it's hard to get in. So if you've been through an internship, at least you've got some experience to show. So look at that. Look at some of the different open source projects. OWASP has a lot of things. So if you want to code on that, like AMAS, which uh, Jeff Foley, he's presenting here today, I believe on AMAS. Mm -hmm. So they're always looking for people to help contribute to that project, just like OWASP Zap. So just get out there and, and get on Twitter. And, and there's a, a large amount, number of people from the community out there on, on Twitter. They refer to it as InfoSec Twitter. So that's a good place to learn. Yeah. But yeah, working on bug bounties, if you work in, if you, if you got a home lab and you know how to hack things and understand the methodology, and if you get an interview and you can describe that, 
you know, sometimes you can get a job. When I got my first pen test job, my background was I'd run vulnerability scanners. I've worked in AppSec and network security, had a sysadmin background. So I didn't have a pen testing background. But part of what helped me is I had a home lab and he saw that I was willing to learn on my own. You know, a lot of times what people run into the corporate world is some people only want to learn when they're on the clock and they want right. to do it on their own. So companies are looking for people that are they're wanting to learn because, you know, if you yeah. enjoy what you do and you're going to make a better employee. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't uh, agree with that more. I mean, you, you see so much more where people are looking for passion as opposed to an eight to five type deal. Um, you know, so there's lots of different ways. I mean, GitHub is is a resume anymore. You know, so if you're involved in, in helping, if you've got some coding chops and you can, you know, you can help to expand some of these open source projects, that's always great things. Um, what do you think about the masters in cybersecurity? Is it, is it worth it? Is it, uh, is it good to go that direction? What type of advice? I think people, I think people getting, getting started out, it may be a good idea because right now, since there's a security shortage, once industry gets enough people, because like Ernest and Young recently, uh, did away with the four-year degree requirement. Used to, you had to have a bachelor's mm -hmm. to work for Ernst & Young, but they did away with that because there's such a shortage of security people. But I think if the industry ever starts to catch up where there's more people in the industry and there's less mm -hmm. of a shortage, then they start getting picky again. So yeah. if you're wanting to move into management, it's probably good to have. And if you ever want to teach, a lot of, it's you a know, I teach at a community college. Yeah, it's a requirement to have at least a master's. Yeah. My, my thoughts are, you know, and again, you take this for whatever it is, everybody has opinions, but um, there's an opportunity for people to be able to, to earn some money, get some experience. You know, if you went straight through school and only were in the academic world and only, you know, ever had that level of experience, even getting out with a master's degree, you might not have that much opportunity unless you did some big projects, right? Uh, you might not have that many opportunities to get jobs. So, you know, play it by ear, figure out if the masters actually make sense. But I see a lot of people get into college and they're like, you know, well, I've gone for four years. I'm comfortable here and I'm not, I don't feel like going into the, into the big world just yet. So let's get a master's and then they end up with debt. So just think about that when you're going through your planning. If you want to do the masters, here's the thing to do, you know, get your bachelor's degree done and then go to work for someone and have them pay for your masters. Amen. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and they'll do it. A lot of companies pay for it. And, you know, one of the things not to overlook, if you're looking at masters and stuff, if you do like a master's, you know, in, in security, then you may do like a dual major and, and get an MBA Get because the business knowledge is that's important. That's what the thing that I'm, I'm lacking the most whenever people I, that I work with, the one area that I'm really – know nothing about is the business side. So that's something not to, to discount either. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So my background, um, you know, heavy technical, but I actually have a bachelor's in business and I tell you what it has, you know, when you're talking to C level, if you can, if you can translate and speak their language, life is very different as a technical person. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like I, I put on my mask and go talk to them and pretend, <laughs> but you know, it works, right? Yeah, and that's the that's the thing because you know there's a lot of time they're trying to justify stuff and people with a business background, you know, they're able to you know they're able to write documents to justify things better. They understand, you know, the the, the business requirements better. So I mean, it's good good to have. And along those lines too is while you're learning is make sure you work on your your writing skills because oh, communication yeah. skills are big. You know, be able to write properly and i mean you don't want to write like you're sending a text message you want to make sure you use proper grammar and capitalization and punctuation all that stuff so that's you know i got into the industry without a degree i was mm. i like I went to like a a uh novell netware cne training course and i got into the industry and it was back at the around the dot-com boom so they were looking for a lot of sysadmin folks so i got in there I didn't have a degree, but I ended up later on going and getting my associate's degree because the college offered uh, credit for certifications. So I got credit for my MCSC, uh, CISSP, and then even like uh, C Cisco CCNA. So I had a bunch of tech, a bunch of tech certs, and they gave me credit for it. But the, it was worth going back to school because English composition, learning to write, I learned so much from that class that I've got more out of that than anything I took in college. 
That's right. That's right. It's so funny because on Discord, people are like, what's a CNE? <laughs> <So> <laughs> all, all us, all us old people that started out before, you know, before there was actually like programs in college, you know, uh, it's just, it's so funny. But yeah, I think, I think it's different now. It it's definitely requires that you have more, you know, there's, there's their credentialing, but I think at the end of the day, the experience is the key thing. So whatever you do, make sure you're out there, make sure you're out there using these skills, you're finding opportunities to intern because that's what's going to pay off the most. Yeah. Before I forget this too, here's an another thing and I was about to, about to forget about it, but you know, do talks, go present at your local meetups and mm -hmm. you know, your B sides conferences and stuff. We had a guy that at our local DEF CON group, the guy was a recent, recent college grad, a hiring manager from Citibank was there and saw his talk on uh, digital forensics. Mm -hmm. He saw his presentation and asked for the guy's resume and the guy got hired. See, that's so, perfect. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because think about it. If you're doing a pen test, where's the money? The money is in the presentation, right? It's to it's yeah. the, their findings and the results. So if you can speak and you've got those capabilities, you know, the, the jobs definitely are a lot easier to get there. Yep. And if okay. you have a hard time with public speaking, Toastmasters is a great way. Yeah, I'm a claim to be a good speaker, but I was terrified to speak in public until I went through Toastmasters. I couldn't do it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and uh, from from somebody that has a, a theater background, so I actually, um, you know, that's kind of how I got started in, in doing a lot of these types of things. Uh, take an improv class. If if you can actually get into a room and you can get in front of people and you can do improv and things like that, you know, that's yeah. an opportunity where you can really master the ability to, to not always feel like you either have to be saying something or that, you know, you're not able to put your thoughts together in a way that people can understand. So all these things are great skills. Yeah, that's, that's good because it's interesting because one of the best, one of the best speakers I know of is the pastor, actually retired pastor from my church. He was big in theater mm -hmm. and he was a storyteller. So man, if you can, and, and when you mentioned the improv, that's one of the nice things about, uh, Toastmasters is they have an improv portion of the meeting where they will come up with a subject and you got to talk on that subject for two minutes. It could be something ridiculous or something you have no idea about, but you've got to talk for two minutes. And so it really teaches you to think on your feet. So you, yeah. it's not as good as taking an improv class, but you kind of get some of the same exposure. That's awesome. Um, what do you, so it looks like we had one more question um, regarding uh, 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 programming languages. So everybody hears about Python. Python's really, really hot right now. What What are your thoughts uh, from a programming perspective? Yeah, Python is good. And I definitely would, that one's, you know, it's been popular for a while. There's a lot of libraries out there written in Python, but another one that's good is Go, Golang. Yep. Yep. Google's yeah. language. Yeah, I saw that and I've been taking courses on that myself. And uh, the reason I got into the programming part is I saw the book came out, Black Hat Go. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the, the things about it compared to Python is you can compile it. So you can, and it's cross-platform, so you can, you can compile it on Linux or Mac and run it on Windows. So you can cross-compile it on an operating system that's not going to run on to run on Windows. Right. So if you're doing a pen test, you need to write something, then you can compile it to run on Windows. So Golang is pretty big. I mean, uh, BetterCap is written. It's a man-in-the-middle tool. It's written in Golang. Uh, AMAS is written in Go. Jeff Foley is a big fan of it, the creator of AMAS. Mm -hmm. So that's a good one, Python or, or Golang. Yeah. Rust is also really, really getting popular. So, you know, if you're kind of on the cutting edge, Rust is, is really starting to make, a, make it, itself known because of the, uh, just the inherent memory security. So a lot of the things that we do from a buffer overflow perspective, uh, Rust has a lot of things built into it as a language that, uh, you know, help to to protect against a lot of that stuff. So worth looking at, but definitely the most popular would be Python, uh, Go, uh, JavaScript and, and you know, standard, uh, you know, HTML, knowing those types of things also helps, especially if you're doing any pen testing on, um, you know, websites or, you know, those types of platforms, it, it really just kind of depends. And that once you learn learn how to code or learn a little bit about it, when you a lot of times you'll get exploit code and if you have to run it, sometimes you have to alter it. Mm -hmm. And so understanding, you know, just to be able to modify programs and scripts is, is very helpful too. 
Yep, absolutely. Well, I think we're, I think we've hit most of the questions. Yep, looks like we're good. So um, I can't thank you enough. I mean, I guess at this point you didn't have anything else to cover. We're just kind of doing a and a but uh, yep. I can't thank you enough. I think it was a wonderful session. I uh, appreciate you uh, you being here and, and representing. And, you know, please, guys and, and, and gals and, and everyone else, uh, reach out. Let us know what we can do to, you know, to improve this. And, you know, you guys have contact information for everyone. And, you know, um, excellent job today, Philip. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone, for attending.